Okay, so good afternoon and let's begin. Uh, just to recap, the last time we saw some other consequences of the Gershkorin disk theorem, and then uh, we started discussing about uh, perturbation location and, uh, and perturbation of eigenvalues, namely that the eigenvalues of a matrix change when the matrix is perturbed. And so the, um, the starting point is that we are given a matrix A of size n cross n, and it has eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2, up to lambda n. And this matrix A is getting perturbed by a matrix E to get the matrix A plus E. And suppose we compute the eigenvalues um, lambda hat 1 up to lambda hat n, or in particular, if some eigenvalue is lambda hat, what can we say about um, how close lambda hat will be to one of the eigenvalues of the matrix A. That is, uh, can we say something about lambda hat minus lambda i modulus value for some i? That is, will this, will this value be small for some one of the eigenvalues of A? And uh, there are various ways to answer this question. Um, first of all, if A happens to be a diagonal matrix, if A happens to be a diagonal matrix, then we can simply directly use the Gershkorn disk theorem to say that this uh, difference between uh, lambda hat and one of the eigenvalues is at most the uh, L infinity norm of E. This is what we saw the last time. And the other case is when lambda is a simple eigenvalue of A, meaning that it has an algebraic multiplicity equal to one. Then if we denote X to be the left eigen, uh, sorry, the right eigenvector corresponding to lambda, that is um, AX equals lambda X, and Y to be a left eigenvector corresponding to lambda, that is Y Hermitian A equals lambda Y Hermitian. Then um, if E is a perturbation matrix such that uh, its spectral norm equals one, then uh, if we denote A of T to be A plus T times E, then we can study what happens to the, uh, how sensitive are the eigenvalues of A uh, by looking at the modulus of the derivative of the eigenvalue at T equals zero. So we showed that this is less than or equal to one over S of lambda, where S of lambda is defined to be the magnitude of y Hermitian x and s of lambda, we called it the condition number or the condition of the eigenvalue lambda. So this is for simple eigenvalues, okay? So it's an eigenvalue of A with algebraic multiplicity equal to one. <laughs> then we looked at the case where A is a diagonalizable matrix and E can be anything. That means A can be written as S lambda S inverse for some invertible matrix a, S and a diagonal matrix lambda. Then we showed that lambda hat minus lambda i is at most k of s times the norm of E uh, for some i, where this norm is any matrix norm such that the norm of a diagonal matrix is the maximum magnitude diagonal entry in the matrix. And k of s here is the condition number of this matrix s with respect to this norm used here. Of course, the condition number is greater than or equal to one, and it is equal to one when S is unitary. So if the matrix is unitarily diagonalizable, then we have that lambda hat minus lambda i is less than or equal to norm of E itself. So this K of S is equal to one. And so then normal matrices are unitarily diagonalizable. So as a consequence, if A is a normal matrix and E is arbitrary, then we have that lambda hat minus lambda i is at most the uh, here we've taken the spectral norm of E for some eigenvalue lambda I of A. The next one is that uh, suppose A and E are both Hermitian symmetric matrices. Then uh, if we denote lambda 1 to lambda n to be the ordered eigenvalues of A and lambda hat 1 through lambda hat n to be the ordered eigenvalues of A plus E, then we can lower bound lambda hat k minus lambda k. So this is taking the kth largest eigenvalue of A plus E and subtracting the kth largest eigenvalue of A itself. And that is at least equal to lambda one of E and at most equal to lambda n of E. 
and further this magnitude of this difference is at most the spectral radius of e okay so this is where we stopped the last time now we consider one more case where a and a plus e are both normal matrices what that means is that we can um, write a as u lambda u hamitian and a plus e as v lambda v hamitian where u and v are both unitary matrices because normal matrices can be unitarily diagonalized now if we look at uh, the frobenius norm square e2 square then that is the frobenius norm square of a plus e minus a which i can write as u lambda hat u hamitian just substituting for a plus e and minus u lambda u hamitian just substituting for a frobenius norm square and what i can do is um, since the frobenius norm square of a unitary matrix is um, uh, no yeah so i can pull out a, a u on the left and a u hamitian on the right and uh, uh, since the since multiplication by left or right multiplication by a unitary matrix does not change the frobenius norm of a matrix i can get rid of u and u hamitian and write it as the norm of z lambda hat z hamitian minus lambda square where z which is equal to u hamitian v is a unitary matrix okay so now this is a unitary matrix and uh, this frobenius norm square we know that it can be written as trace of so frobenius norm squared of a is trace of a a hamitian so i just write that here so this is trace of z lambda hat z hamitian minus lambda times the hamitian of this which is z hamitian hamitian is just z lambda hat hamitian z hamitian minus lambda hamitian if i just expand this out this gives me this times this which is just the frobenius norm of z lambda hat z hamitian square and then this times this is just the frobenius norm of lambda square minus 2 times trace of the inner product between this and this which is z lambda hat z hamitian times lambda hamitian now again this is multiplication by a unitary matrix so i can get rid of this z on the left and z hamitian on the right and write this as lambda hat 2 square plus lambda 2 square minus 2 real uh, real part of trace of this matrix the same as the previous equation so what are we trying to do here we are trying to um, see how relate this e2 square to the eigen values of a and a plus e so that we can ultimately bound Uh, e two square. So, for example, here you can already see that this uh, this uh, Frobenius norm square. This is just a diagonal matrix, so it's just the sum of the diagonal entry squared. This is also a diagonal matrix, so it's just the sum of the diagonal entry squared. And then there's this term. I'll come to that in a sec. But um, the point is that on the right hand side, I have terms that depend only on the eigen values of a and a plus e. And uh, if I can find an expression for for this quantity which only depends on the eigen values of a and a plus e then now i'll have an upper bound which connects eigen values of a and a plus e with the frobenius norm squared of the error matrix or the perturbation matrix so that's the final goal is to find some expression for this quantity which depends only on lambda hat and lambda i now this quantity itself is uh, something whatever it is but if i replace it with something bigger then i'm only making this, this whole expression smaller so i can say that it's greater than or equal to these two terms minus a quantity g star where i define g star to be the maximum that this can attain over all possible unitary matrices z so g star is the max of this thing two real trace of W lambda hat W Hamitian lambda Hamitian over all matrices W which are unitary. Now, if I simply expand this out, right, and take into account the fact that lambda and lambda Hamitian are both diagonal matrices, I can write this two real trace of W lambda hat W Hamitian lambda Hamitian as the summation over I J going from one to n of the 
modulus of W i j square times the real part of lambda i star times lambda, lambda j hat. Is there a question? Okay, so this is like this. Now, suppose we define a matrix C with entry C i j. C i j is equal to this quantity. This is this coefficient of this term here. Now, what is this matrix C? It has non-negative entries. Okay, and if you take the sum of the rows, uh, the entries in any given row or the sum of the entries along any given column, they all add up to one because W is a unitary matrix. Okay, such a matrix is called a doubly stochastic matrix, a matrix with non-negative entries where every column adds up to one and every row adds up to one is called a doubly stochastic matrix. And so um, what we what we see is that whenever W is unitary, then this matrix C will be a doubly stochastic matrix. However, the converse need not be true in the sense that if I take a C which is doubly stochastic, um, it there may not exist a, a unitary W such that mod W I squared is this uh, doubly stochastic matrix. So if I replace the maximization over W with maximization over all matrices C which are doubly stochastic, then I'm only expanding my, potentially expanding my uh, uh, space, uh, expanding the space over which I'm doing this optimization. So this is further upper bounded by the maximum of two Cij. So Wij squared is equal to Cij times this real part of lambda i star uh, times lambda j hat over all possible doubly stochastic matrices. Now this objective function is linear in this matrix, in the entries of this matrix C and uh, further you know, a linear function is both a convex and a concave function of uh, these uh, variables. And so as a consequence, um, this is this amounts to maximizing a convex function over the space of doubly stochastic matrices. OK, so in order to solve this optimization problem, we need to know something about this constraint space. What is the space of um, doubly stochastic matrices. So let's precisely define that. So suppose DS is the set of all doubly stochastic matrices. Okay. It's a small exercise to show that DS is a convex set. That is, you take any two um, doubly stochastic matrices, and if you take a convex combination of those two matrices, you will get a doubly stochastic matrix. So you can show this very easily. So the set DS is actually convex. Okay, now we uh, we use one very, very fundamental result from optimization that the maximum of a convex function over a convex set is always attained at what is called an extremal point of the convex set. Okay, similarly, if you want to minimize a concave function over a convex set, the minimum will occur at an extremal point of the convex set. So uh, just to give you the idea, suppose I have a convex function like this, and if I have a convex set in on this real line, which is an interval, and if I want to, in fact, um, yeah, if I want to maximize this convex function over this convex set, then the maximum will occur at an extreme point. This is also true if I take a convex function that looks like this, for instance. Okay, the maximum will be either this point or this point, depending on which one is higher. The minimum could be uh, at some point inside, but the maximum will always be at an extreme point of the convex set. Okay, so, um, so then what is an extreme point? It's like the endpoints of the convex set, but the generalization is as follows. So if D is a convex set on some defined on some vector space, um, we say that X, a point X in D is an extremal point or an extreme point of D if there is no lambda 1, lambda 2 greater than 0, which add up to 1, and X1, X2 belonging to D such that lambda 1 x1 plus lambda 2 x2 is equal to x. In other words, you cannot find two points that are internal to the set D, where if you take a, a convex combination of those two points, you will get this point x. Okay, the, the, so that you can see that from this interval also. If I take either this point or this point, I cannot write this as 
write this point or this point as a convex combination of two points that are internal to this convex set. Whereas if I take a point here, I can write it as a convex combination of these two extreme points. So this is not an extreme point. So for example, in two dimensions, if I have a polygon like this, then the corners of the polygon are all extreme points. Or if I have a circle in two dimensions like this, the entire boundary of the circle is a, are, are extreme points. Okay. So the solution to this um, to this optimization problem, okay, will be at one of the extreme points of this convex set. So all we need to do is to identify what are the extreme points of this convex set, substitute those extreme points, and then pick the be the best the highest value we can get. So we need to understand what would be the extreme points of this particular convex set. Okay. So the the extreme points of this convex set are actually given by a theorem which is known as Birkhoff theorem or the Birkhoff von Neumann theorem. This is one of the, uh, this is a theorem I will not be proving in the class. It's a, it's a, it will digress too much from what we want to do. Plus we are, we don't have time to prove this theorem here. But basically what it says is that this set DS, okay, is the, convex hull, don't worry about uh, if you don't know what this convex hull means, it's the convex hull of the set of n cross n perturbation uh, permutation matrices. Okay, And the extremal points of DS are precisely these permutation matrices. Okay, That's the punchline. The extremal points of DS are precisely the permutation matrices. So basically if C is a doubly stochastic matrix, then there exists an n less than infinity, alpha 1 to alpha n non-negative and adding up to 1 and permutation matrices p1 to pn such that you can write c to be alpha 1 p1 plus etc up to alpha n pn. Okay. So any, any doubly stochastic matrix can be written as a convex combination of permutation matrices. That's the punchline. And the, these permutation matrices are essentially vertices of this convex set DS. In fact, some side notes here are that there is another famous theorem called Kara Theodori's theorem, which says that you can choose n to be at most um, n squared minus 2 n plus 2. That is n minus 1 the whole squared plus 1. Okay, so while there exist uh, n factorial permutation matrices of size n cross n, we don't need to use all n factorial permutation matrices to decompose a given doubly stochastic matrices. We can make do with at most n squared minus 2 n plus 2 matrices. And further, this, this decomposition is not unique. There are, there are various ways in which you can uh, decompose. If I go back to this example here, so if I take a point over here, obviously, you know, I can write this as a convex combination of uh, these extreme points in multiple ways. For example, I can take these three points and find a convex combination will get me here. Or I can potentially take these three points and write it as a convex combination of these three points and so on. So there's no unique way to do it. But in this case, you can see that um, um, uh, for any point, I can take a, I can, I can, I can reach any point by taking a convex combination of three points. So when n equals 2, what happens to n squared minus 2n plus 2? n squared is 4 minus 4 plus 2. In fact, two points are enough. That's what Kara Theodori's theorem says. But this is not this. This is not the uh, convex set corresponding to um, permutation matrices. So if you look at the 2 cross 2 doubly stochastic matrices, you can write any 2 cross 2 doubly stochastic matrix as a con convex combination of at most two permutation matrices. Okay, so then what is a permutation matrix? It's uh, basically a square binary matrix with exactly one entry equal to one in every row and one, ex one entry equal to one in every column and zeros everywhere else. And uh, we've also seen these matrices uh, previously. We know that PA permutes the rows of A and AP permutes the columns of A. Okay, so um, now if we use this Birkhoff's theorem, then there exists a permutation matrix P 
that solves this optimization problem because these the uh, solution to this optimization problem is an extreme point and the extreme points are all permutation matrices so um, for that permutation matrix we go back to the earlier way of writing this uh, uh, this expression and we write it as two times real part of trace of now p is a permutation matrix so p lambda hat p transpose because it's zeros and ones you don't need a hermitian there times lambda hermitian okay and now p lambda hat is a permutation of the columns p transpose lambda hat lambda hat hermitian is a permutation of the rows of lambda hermitian now so if p e i is equal to e or e of sigma of i so sigma of i represents the permutation so basically what it's saying is that the index i is getting mapped to index sigma of i that is what this permutation matrix is doing so there are different ways of writing out a permutation matrix one is to write it as a matrix and the other is to specify this uh, sigma of i the permutation function which maps indices i equal to 1 to n to i equal to 1 to n okay so if we if we do this and then we substitute that into this expression you can actually simplify this formula to this expression here so we now see that what we are left with is just lambda i star times lambda hat of sigma of i okay so it's just products of permuted versions of lambda hat so thus what we have shown is that this e2 square the l2 norm of e square is lower bounded by the summation i equal to 1 to n lambda hat of sigma of i square so it was lambda hat i squared earlier but sigma of i is just a permutation so all the entries will get included if i use sigma sigma of i instead of i itself so this is also okay um, plus the summation i equal to 1 to n lambda i square minus 2 times the real part of sigma hat of uh, lambda hat of sigma of i times lambda i star now this expression here is nothing but the modulus of lambda hat of sigma of i minus lambda i squared added up i equal to 1 to n so now this is beautiful because i am now shown that this quantity here which is the sum of the squared differences of the eigen values of a and a plus e these are the eigen values of a these are the eigen values of a plus e but written in some other order sigma of i this sum is at most equal to the L, uh, the frobenius norm squared of e so what we've shown is what is it is known as the hoffman weiland theorem which says that if a and e are both uh, n cross n matrices a and a plus e both being normal matrices and lambda 1 to lambda n and lambda hat 1 to lambda hat n are the eigen values of a and a plus e respectively and in some order then there exists a permutation sigma of i of the integers 1 to n such that summation i equal to 1 to n lambda hat of sigma of i minus lambda i squared is at most the norm of e square okay so basically what this theorem does is to show that there is a strong global stability it's strong because it just depends on e2 square and it's global because it doesn't matter which e you pick even if you choose adversarially this thing is at most e2 square and uh, these are stable or uh, to um, stability of the set of eigenvalues of a normal matrix okay so this is uh, one more result that we have about the perturbation of eigenvalues of a matrix okay so um, if a is not diagonalizable we seen that um, we can uh, find a formula for perturbation of um, algebraically simple eigenvalues
and we can also um, do one other thing which is that uh, we can approximate um, a arbitrarily by a diagonalizable matrix. So we can approximate this matrix A arbitrarily closely by a diagonalizable matrix. And then uh, everything we said about diagonalizable matrix are, is applicable and we can then say something about how the matrix uh, A will get perturbed. Uh, what we mean by uh, we can approximate it arbitrarily closely by a diagonalizable matrix is something we've already seen before. So I'll just state that to recall what we said. So A is an N cross N matrix. And uh, so suppose this is any norm. then given epsilon greater than zero, there exists a matrix A1, C to the N cross N, such that A1 has N distinct eigenvalues and A minus A1 is actually less than or equal to epsilon. In fact, you can even make this strictly less than. Okay, is, is at most epsilon. And uh, corollary to this, the set of matrices is dense on Okay, so given a matrix A in C to the N cross N, I can find a diagonalizable matrix which is arbitrarily close to uh, this matrix A. So it's useful because um, one, one useful way of uh, approaching um, uh, uh, perturbation related problems is to first solve for diagonal matrices, then solve for diagonalizable matrices, and then use the approximation uh, and some limiting process to say something about what happens in the non diagonalizable case. Yeah.